Um, what I'm now going to do is just aware of time. I think we've got about 10 minutes just about um, for, for a few of you to answer a couple of the questions that have come in the Q&A box. So we'll move on to that now. Thank you to everybody um, for your um, overviews and contributions and for um, engaging in that brief kind of roundtable conversation. Thank you to those who have popped some questions in the chat box. We'll now take a couple of them before we um, wind up the event. So um, there's a question here that I think is quite interesting from George. Thank you very much, George, for this question. So here, um, George asks or says, there's always a trade-off between security culture and publicity, especially with more radical anti-state power groups. Given that infiltration is likely to happen at some point anyway, is there an argument that radical groups should be more open in order to reach more people, or does security become more important as the state becomes more authoritarian? So quite a, a thoughtful, um, thought-provoking one there. So I welcome any, any thoughts from any of you. Adam, yes, please feel free. Yeah, so there's there's clearly a balance to be struck there, right? I'm, I'm part of a, um, uh, um, uh, an organization that, um, that for a while did not have any new members um, in terms of organizing um, on the streets and what have you. It's something like we, that we do, but um, we, we were unable to uh, accept new members while we're sorting out a lot of things, as well as uh, dealing with uh, uh, the potential threat of, of course, um, infiltration and whatnot. So it's a huge concern for many people who are involved in um, direct action, as well as uh, trying to organize mass mobilizations. Um, but I think I think it all... It, it, um, on, uh, it it comes back to something that Emily was 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 uh, saying earlier on about why is it that the state does what it does? Um, why is it that they try to infiltrate groups that they you know try to get as paranoid about? Is the person next to me a police officer in this meeting and what have you? It's to dissuade us from getting involved in campaigning. It's to dissuade us from you know taking up resistance. Um, uh, I I think, uh, think that somebody's asked for a repeat of the question. Um, so yeah, I'll just, that's already been, it's, it's in the chat box already, Adam, continue. Okay. Um, so um, I think, so <clears throat> we, we, can't, we can't let this, the state be successful in this attempt to dissuade us from organizing against it. The only reason why the state is attempting to dissuade you from getting involved in these kinds of campaigns and what have you is because it knows that it's the only effective way to challenge it on these questions. You can't allow fear to be the driving force of your politics. Hope should be central to our organizing. Um, and uh, so I, sound, I feel like I sound quite soppy when I say that, but it's, but it's true. We all know it to be true. Um, and, and so we need to, we need to think about ways in which we can continue to organize, but organize with our safety in mind um, and learn lessons from past, move, past movements and groups that have, uh, have been infiltrated, right? Um, so some of the ways that, um, uh, it's because, you know, if, 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 if we're in a, if we're in a, if we're in a, if we're on a protest and, um, you know, some of the people on that protest alongside us are undercover police officers, I don't care, that's a, few, that's a few more people on that demo, right? I don't care. But the, um, but the dangerous thing is that when um, uh, we lose sight of the, the, the goals of, that we're organizing towards and some of the ways that the state tries to derail people from their original intention for what they're organizing around. And that's the main important thing, I think, that we need to continue to reaffirm our con con conviction and our commitment to what it is that we're struggling for. Um, and I feel like I'm starting to ramble a little bit, so I, I'll just end it there. Cheers very much, Adam. Um, again, for emphasizing this importance of politics of hope, I think that a lot of people can really relate to that. Often these conversations feel quite doom and gloomy, um, so it's quite important that we have that. So the next question is just keeping our time. I seem to not be able to see it anymore, but there was a conversation, sorry, a question in here that was related to kind of the role of universities in this um, conversation around, um, I guess, links. So this is work that many of us are quite familiar with, the likes of demilitarized education, obviously CAT unis as well. But does anyone have any thoughts, especially each of you in some way, shape or form um, have connections to universities? So do we, yeah, do you have any kind of reflections on the role of universities when it comes to, I guess, um, underpinning and supporting um, the militarization of policing and even things around research, around tech, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, Annie, is that you raising your hand? <laughs> it is. I've got the little one here, so we may have some shelving. Um, but what I would say is that universities are such an absurd. Give me a fact. Someone else might have. Okay. Um, so Adam, can you? Yeah. So. One, one of the immediate ways that I can think of, um, and, and, and yes, universities are entirely complicit, I guess, let's, let's not beat around the bush on that. Um, but one of, the, one, of the, one of the ways that people have been holding universities to account on this is to um, push for uh, 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 a, 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 uh, for, for, for a divestment um, campaign around, around these things. So getting university to divest from um, the uh, military industrial complex. But there's another aspect, right? So I studied at the University of Bradford um, in their peace studies department, but there's another uh, university elsewhere in the country that has a war studies department with very close links um, to the military industrial complex. And I suppose in some ways peace studies also does, but there, there's also an academic um, uh, sense of, of complicity with like research, uh, research being funded by um, and and driven um, uh, by uh, the by the state's interest in terms of furthering the military industrial complex. Um, so these are some other things that we should also be challenging. Is we wouldn't stand for the tobacco uh, lobby to continue to have a hold over our universities like they might have had in previous years, um, in, in in previous decades. Uh, I don't know how long ago that would have been, but you know they, they used to fund um, scientists to give us bogus sort of research around why it's not harmful for us to be smoking. In fact, that could be health, healthy and all the rest of it. This compromises the integrity of our um, places of learning of these academic institutions. And similarly, um, the complicity of uh, uh, our academic institutions with the Ministry of Industrial Complex it, does, it, it allows us to be blind to the real threats and harm being done um, by this. Um, and I think it also compromises integrity of these academic institutions similarly. And um, so we should be pushing for you know, a break of all of this funding coming from, um, from uh, the Ministry of Defence, um, that there should not be any briefings and, and what have you, and, and you know, a complete disengagement by academic institutions, but also that we should be pushing for universities to divest from this very lucrative business of uh, selling weapons that kill others around the world. Um, and Britain has got a huge uh, role to play in the uh, driving of conflicts, uh, not least what's happening in Yemen today, um, but also elsewhere in the world, Palestine especially. Thank you very, very much. Adam, thank you so, so much to our speakers for that whirlwind tour of quite a not even quite, a humongous conversation. Um, we know we only really managed to scratch the surface, um, but we do hope this was thought provoking and maybe for some of you, certainly an introduction to some of these concepts. I know that um, some people are here simply out of curiosity and some people already are very familiar and active on this topic. And hopefully um, the report that we have commissioned that Karen has written um, is something that will, as I said before, not just live as a report, but be a very practical, useful resource and guide for campaigners on the ground for many years to come. So what I'm going to do now is invite our speakers to just say some closing words. Karen, I'll ask you to go last, just as obviously the author of the report. So Emily, I'll hand over to you for just some kind of closing remarks, please. Um, just, well, thank you to everyone for contributions. I think it was an amazing conversation to have and I was like, yeah, a real honour to be part of it. Um, I think just to say that we're in, like, in terms of protest and campaigning, we're in an era of really repressive policing and really repressive government in terms of the attitude towards um, protest. But I think what's been said about hope is really important. Like this repressive legislation is there, the surveillance is there because the state is scared of our power and we're having these conversations and we are strong. And if we use that collective solidarity, if we refuse to be divided into good protesters and bad protesters and we keep that strength and we work together, we can make these changes and we can still have that power. Protest is not illegal. We still have the right to protest and we have the right to assemble, we have the right to get our voices heard. And the more that we do this, and the more that we all have these conversations and 
find ways to work together and to join these dots then we have a movement and then we have hope and then we can bring about and start bringing about some of these changes that we all want to see Thank you very, very much, Emily. And once again, also thank you um, to Netpol for being wonderful partners and collaborators on this on this report as well. And there's plenty of links in the chat box to the important work that everyone is doing here, including Netpol as well. So Adam, some brief reflections from you to close out, please. Um, yeah, so I I just, you know, wanted to keep it short and sweet in terms of, so, what can people practically do? I know a lot of us are thinking about this report and, and how it's quite insightful, but also wondering about in, like steps that we can take as individuals to, um, you know, to not only uh, challenge this, but but to also defend our right to protest and all these other things. There's a question around that. that somebody asked me. Um, you defend your right to protest by exercising it. You have to really take to the streets and get involved in whatever campaigns you can to show the state that it's. That you know, this is something that you're not going to give up without struggle, um, and they cannot take it from us. Um, rights are, are won, they're not, they're not given, um, and our civil liberties are something that no one can ever uh, take from us. They are inherent, um, uh, and, 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 and they will exist forever, our, our civil liberties, and the state can do whatever it wishes, but it cannot um, take them from us. Now, what, what in terms of other things that people um, can do, I think it, you know, in terms of like, you know, shifting our mindsets around this, uh, terms like abolition might be new to some of us. I know it was new to me a couple of years ago. Get involved in, you know, various reading groups. Um, there's an organization called Abolitionist Futures that runs these fantastic reading groups twice a year um, and also supports people to set up these reading groups in their locales. Get, Im get involved in you know learning about abolition and spreading this kind of uh, this uh, this kind of um, th way of thinking that's really catching on um, in 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 your communities and share it with people that you're organizing with. And lastly, um, <clears throat> you know don't don't be scared of, of all of these things that are happening. Um, uh, the the point that I I cannot stress enough around this is, and some of us have said is. That the state is only doing this because it, it it knows our collective power and it's absolutely terrified of what it is that we can achieve we can truly transform society if we knew our collective power and all it takes is for all of us to just you know wake up to that reality and to exercise our ability to transform society from the bottom up incredibly powerful closing reflections adam thank you so much annie some brief closing reflections from you and then we'll hand, hand over to karen absolutely i'll try to be as brief as possible so I guess in closing, I just remembering that we have a history, right? And we get taught a particular history of what the things the state has done in school and things like great men like MLK, et cetera, have done. But the engine of history is people like you, like me, like everyone on this call, right? And connecting to the history of people's struggles is so important to empowering ourselves um, with knowledge, but also confidence to be able to resist. But we also have virtues. I think one of the ways that we resist some of the tactics of the state is remembering that abolition is first and foremost an act of love. It's a vote of confidence in the capacity of people to do better than harm, right? Um, and so in that sense, abolition is also not simply an act of destruction, it's an act of creation. It's an invitation for all of us, even if we're not able to make it down to protests, even if we're not able to tweet 24 seven, even if we're not able to build groups in our local um, communities to connect with people, but also to connect with people in terms of imagination about what the world can be other than the one that we've been given. That's all. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, more powerful closing reflections. And last, but absolutely not least, we'll hand over to Karen. I am just so um, honored to be part of this conversation that on one hand, as others have said, we've touched on such troubling issues, but it's also ended on uh, just a note of hope and solidarity and the importance of organizing. So the report really at the end of the day is really synthesizing the work of so many other people um, beyond myself, so many scholars and activists and civil society work, uh, organizations that have for years been working on this issue. And I would just echo Annie's 
you know, solicitation to look to our history and look to our past to try to chart out new futures. And also to just remember that the idea that war and policing are somehow fundamentally di different powers is itself a fiction and a fiction that has helped to normalize the police and normalize their, their presence and their increasing power and one that we, we all need to be actively dismantling through, through the work that we did. And um, yeah, I'll just end, end on that. And thank you all for the very engaging and hopeful conversation. Thank you so much, Karen. And I want to thank all our speakers for their generosity, for their patience, and for their insights this evening. Karen, um, thank you. Um, Karen is someone who does not centre herself in these conversations. And absolutely, as you have said, there is a long, long history, um, essential to this history is the experiences of folks who have been marginalised for centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, but I also do want to just emphasise that the report that you have written, Karen, has enabled a very powerful um, conversation, is a powerful contribution to this work. And once again, um, we hope that all of you will go and read the report um, and read the exec summary and continue diving into the canon of work that exists. There will be more of this work as well that obviously our wonderful speakers here have contributed to. Someone in the chat, I just want to close because I think that it was said really beautifully. George said, I'd also add, take care of yourself and those around you in these tough times. Our enemies will never have our level of love and care, so we mustn't forget it ourselves. I think that is a wonderful, wonderful way to end our conversation.